is like a hurricane here in tech world. Deadlines, roadmaps, e campaigns, all those tech nerds chasing that bonus. Act like they all know tech sales. Every day they're out there making tech sales. Sign it up and line it up, train wreck sales. They're headed for that final contract Shady wording never fails Devs remain trapped The worst of messes They call successes Texas Every day they're out there making Texas Signing up and lining up train wrecks Commission market they're on a mission hit those targets that's the reason they got into tech sales C -c commission global market they're on a mission hit
to the Copenhagen Developers Festival, which I've spent the last three months trying really hard not to call NDC Copenhagen, because it's not. I mean, it kind of is. There's a lot of the stuff here that if you've been to NDC's events here in Copenhagen before, same people, same kind of content, but there's a whole bunch of new and interesting and uh, exciting stuff going on here. Now, I know some of you have seen me at NDC events before because I recognize you, and I'm sure some of you have seen me on NDC's YouTube channel doing uh, what my friends call Dylan Talks which are about the importance of the open web to the functioning of a digital connected society and the evolution of email systems in the face of the relentless onslaught of capitalism or... I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff today. No, no, no. I'm going to talk about something way more important than any of that stuff. I'll talk about karaoke. No, no, don't laugh. I think karaoke is the most important art form on this planet. Because... I think that the single most valuable thing any of us can learn to do if we want to enjoy the time we have on this earth is to enjoy doing something we are not good at. Because if you suck at something, but you do it anyway and you have a good time, you're going to do more of it and you are going to get better. You're going to discover your strengths and your weaknesses, your limitations. You're going to work out where you should apply. You're going to get better. You're going to end up, some things, you will end up being proficient, and you will end up being expert, and you will end up being world-class. And other things, you might just suck forever, but it doesn't matter because you are enjoying yourself every moment that you spend doing it. And uh, I think karaoke is one of those things. It's wonderful watching people do it who are good at singing. It's also wonderful watching people do it who are just having a great time and they're out with all their friends and they've had a couple of drinks. And it's one of those things that kind of when you get too good at it, it's a bit weird. You ever done like paintball with your friends from work and someone brings their own gun? And you're like, you, you don't, no, no, no. Or like you got to play crazy golf and someone brings their own golf clubs, Jacob. And you're like, no, no, no. The whole point about this is you just kind of turn up and you go with whatever's there. Now, We've done a lot of awesome karaoke nights after these kinds of events. Uh, there is video floating around somewhere of many people in this crowd packed into a little room in uh, Singmar in Oslo, um, frightening the locals with Rage Against the Machine karaoke. I don't think they knew there was that much profanity when they put it on the list. But <coughs> one of these things we went to, one of these karaoke nights, um, there was the usual deal. You got the room, and you got the video screen, you got the songs, and we had a bunch of these. Inflatable guitars because there is something about having a couple of beers and putting on Guns N' Roses that makes people want to do this. And if you give them an inflatable guitar, it gets better, because now they've got an inflatable guitar. And I'm sitting there, and I'm watching this. Everyone's having a good time, and I'm thinking, I know how to play this song. And I'm sure there are other people who come to this karaoke booth who also know how to play some of these songs. Wouldn't it be cool if we could do karaoke, but we could have real guitars involved with it as well? Uh, now, this idea kind of burrowed into my brain and refused to go away. And I thought, maybe, could it be done? And I looked, and there's a bunch of different people out there who've done variations on instrument karaoke, but most of them are like, they play in a band, and you can get up and you can sing with the band. And I've seen, I've got some friends in London who've done a version of this where uh, what they do is they get their lead singer to sit off stage with the PowerPoint clicker advancing the lyrics so they don't have to worry about going too fast or too slow. There's a couple of acts in London where they just give you like a printed folder with the lyrics in it and the band play. And it's all good and it's all fun, but that wasn't kind of specifically what I had in mind. Now, when you set out to reinvent, reboot, overhaul, to invent something new, you've got to understand where are you starting from. Now, talk oh, about the history of karaoke, which I know is exactly what all of you came along here to learn about. Uh, karaoke started in Japan in the 1960s just as a way for musicians to perform their own material without needing to hire a band. And uh, it was this guy. This is uh, Daisuke Inoue. And he was the first person who thought, well, I could use these backing machines and just get like random people in my bar to get up and sing. This is a picture of him with his original eight-track cartridge Juke karaoke machine. By about 1972, 1973, karaoke meant people in a bar, probably drinking beer, getting up and singing along to pre-recorded backing tracks and became established. So that's kind of one of the two fundamental pillars is you got random people performing and the accompaniment is pre-recorded. Now, the other thing which has become, I think, the second pillar of that is video with the lyrics on it. 
How many of you know this song, uh, uh, Rolling in the Deep by Adele? If we started that song now, there's a guitar that goes ding, 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 ding. And at some point, you have to start singing. And you don't know when. You think you do, because you've listened to the song in a car like a hundred million times. But you don't know how many ding, ding, dings there are before you say there's a... And so the video is necessary, because on this particular song, if you get it wrong, you can be comfortably wrong for about 90 seconds. And then when the drums come in, you're like, oh no, this is horrible, and I don't want to be here anymore. And so I decided those are the, the kind of the fundamental building blocks of a karaoke system. Pre-recorded backing and animated lyrics on the screen so people know when to come in and stuff. Now, the history of karaoke is full of wonderful pieces of technology that none of you has ever heard of. Did you know about compact disc plus graphics? Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously you did, because this is still how you consume your entertainment, Lemon. But most of us, we had no idea, like audio CDs, you remember, see, it's like MP3s on shiny circles that you could put in the car and stuff. There is a data subcarrier wave on the CD audio encoding format, which can carry about 112 kilobits of video data. Now, we're not talking high definition here. If any of you remembers trying to watch real player over dial-up internet, it's that quality of high definition video. But this thing proved incredibly successful as a way of distributing karaoke tracks. Now, there are other things. There was a company in Japan in the 90s who did dial-up karaoke using ASCII and MIDI files. And so that this meant they could have vast libraries of songs. And when you wanted a song, you kind of had to book it like 10 minutes in advance so they could download it over the dial-up, and then they would play it. And uh, if you've ever listened to MIDI file playback, it sounds like the demos on a Casio keyboard a little bit, but it's good fun. And if you get a couple of people together and you pick the songs, that's quite a cool technology. But all of these kind of wonderfully innovative solutions, MIDI files over download, CD graphics, CD plus video CD, all of them fundamentally existed because technology was shit and not good enough to do what we actually wanted to do, which is just give me as much data as I can eat 24 hours a day, wirelessly, anywhere on the planet, I don't care. The problems that this was created to solve don't exist anymore because we have broadband. And uh, you know, a CD-ROM would hold 650 megabytes of data, which was huge when it came out. That is nothing today. Like, we don't even care. You can stick a thousand of these on your computer's D drive without even stopping for breath. All of the technical innovation that went into karaoke technology just kind of fell by the wayside when we got to the point where it's like, yeah, just go on YouTube. Any song you can imagine, it's there. It's this huge library. We got all these songs in it. You click the button, and it just plays the song, and that's it. And I uh, hope you don't get caught by the lawyers, because it's really not supposed to do that, apparently, but it's YouTube. Who cares? Now, the other really interesting thing about diving into karaoke technology, and uh, generally, there's a whole world out there of rhythm-based games, you know, games like uh, Dance Dance Revolution, that kind of stuff, is it is one of the few times in my life that, as an English-speaking white man, I felt like I don't belong here, because the market is absolutely dominated by Japan and Korea. Like, I have been in karaoke booths all over the world. We were in one in Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago where every song I had ever heard of was buried two levels deep underneath a menu option called Western Music. And, you know, there is this vast world out there. Apparently in Japan, uh, Japan and Korea, it is completely normal that when a band brings out the new album, they bring out the karaoke album at the same time, which is the same tracks recorded in the same studio with the lyrics removed, because why would anyone go and buy an album if you can't do it in a karaoke booth? That's the kind of, you know, the, the significance that it has culturally in those countries. Over here, we're like, yeah, let's go to a karaoke booth and, oh, can we dig through this menu and see if there's any Bon Jovi in here? Um, there is, don't worry, we'll get to it. So, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to create an experience that was kind of like a normal uh, karaoke booth experience, but incorporate guitars into it. Now, if any of you have played guitar for a while, or any of you was learning to play guitar in the days before YouTube, you have probably seen things like this. Total accuracy guitar backing tracks. You'd buy a book, and it would come with a CD, and the CD would have recorded tracks which had everything but not the guitar and not the lead singer. So you could put the backing track on, you could turn it way up, and you could jam along and be like, yeah, I'm Eddie Van Halen. Um, and uh, then you'd be like, actually, he's much better than me. Maybe I need ACDC. That's a little bit easier. I thought maybe we could mash these up. You know, maybe there was a way of taking the, the total accuracy guitar backing track and mixing that with the karaoke video so you get the music with no guitar in it, you get the words on the screen so someone can sing along to it, and uh, we could do something on it that way. So I started looking around for places I could get hold of these tracks. Now, 
if any of you have seen uh, our conference band, the Line Breakers, um, so people often say to me, who's officially in Line Breakers? The answer is whoever shows up. Because it's about, I think, 10 or 12 different musicians who live on different continents all over the world. And when we get a certain number of us together in the right place at the right time, we will do a show. And if you haven't seen us, we are going to be on this stage later on this evening. But the downside of that, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we were in Amsterdam and we had a keyboard player. Tonight we don't have a keyboard player because Vagif couldn't make it. So tonight the laptop has to do all of the keyboard parts so we can fill in that. We have different combinations. Sometimes we have live bass, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we got three guitars, sometimes we just got one. And I needed a way of coming up with backing tracks that covered all the different combinations of musicians who might turn up on the night to play the show. And I'm going to introduce you to probably my favorite website in the entire world, karaokeversion.co.uk. Now, this is a kind of side outlet. The main company is called Carafun. They do subscription-based karaoke systems that supply most of the karaoke bars in the UK and the Lucky Voice franchise, all these kinds of things. But they also have this website where you can go on, and if you want to just get the karaoke video, you can. But if you want to download your own personalized mix, you're like, I want all the ACDC, but I'm going to play the cowbell. So give me all the ACDC songs, but take out the cowbell part. We're going to do that bit live. You can do that. It has this incredibly cool web audio interface where you can pick the tracks, you can mix them, and then you hit download. Now, what I thought is, could we pull in individual isolated tracks? Now, I'm just going to say a word here. This is for you, everyone watching this thing on YouTube later, because you will put this in the comments. They're not technically isolated tracks. They are something called stems. An isolated track, if you have a brand with a brass section, the isolated track will be a trumpet with no effects, nothing. There will be a saxophone with no effects, nothing. There'll be a trombone with no effects, nothing on that. Three separate tracks. When you mix all the brass together and put a little bit of reverb on it, that's a stem. And what you can download from this site is stem. So all the brass instruments will be on one track. But that's actually quite a good sort of working approximation for the kind of things that we wanted to do here. So I could go on this site. I could buy these tracks from them for about uh, they're two pounds each, two pounds to get the isolated uh, stems for a track. So you buy the song, you download it, and then I'm like, right, now I need a way of playing this stuff that lets me switch the instruments on and off depending who is doing the karaoke that night. Now, I do most of my music production on my Mac in a thing called Logic. If any of you used, used uh, some of you may have used Logic, if you use GarageBand, Logic is like GarageBand with the metallic paint and the alloy wheels and all the upgrades. It's an incredibly good professional grade piece of studio software. And it will play video. There is a way it's used for people who are scoring video clips or scoring movie soundtracks. You can pull video into Logic and say, we'll play the video over there. So technically, you could run a karaoke night from Logic. There are two drawbacks with it. Um, one, Logic is fiddly. It has things, you want to open a track, it takes maybe four or five seconds to pull in all the different files and draw the waveforms you see on the screen and fill all the bits in, which is absolutely fine when you're working in a studio, but when you're kind of in a bar and people are watching, you want something a little bit more immediate. Uh, the other thing is it runs on Macs, and Macs are expensive, and I don't like taking expensive computers to places where drunk people are waving guitars around. Uh, I do it all the time anyway, but I don't like it. I wanted to find something a little bit more portable, and so, I applied a time-honored engineering problem-solving technique. Do any of you have a box in your house, or maybe a cupboard, or perhaps a, a garage, or an entire room, full of hardware that you bought because it looked cool, and looked at it and went, yeah, and then you put it in the box because it might be useful one day? I had a look in the junk box. And I found, in amongst things that I bought because once upon a time they had seemed like a good idea that I might need one day, I was right. Because it turned out I owned one of these. This is a USB 5.1 audio interface that you can plug into your laptop, and it gives you six separate audio output channels. Now, you can, in theory, put any number of video tracks into a, for any video and audio tracks into something like a Matroska container file. But 5.1 is a special magic number because it is so dominant in home cinema systems. If you can work out a way of getting what you want into five tracks of audio, the 5.1, the point one is weird, because lots of applications don't give you direct access. They're like, no, we're just going to put extra bass on that one. Don't worry about it. You can't mix that separate. So it kind of restricted me to five. But five was sort of enough for what we needed, because this meant I could take five separate physical feeds out of this thing, put them into five channels on a mixing desk, and have the ability to turn individual instruments on and off. Just hit play, get the video going, boom, that's it. Oh, turn down the bass, bring in live bass. Easy enough. You can do it with the physical faders. Now, uh, 
You could do this on screen. Over the last couple of weeks, I have had the joy of renting a car and renting a house. And the car I rented had lots of touchscreens in it, and the house I rented had a touchscreen stove, which I think is the dumbest thing human beings have ever invented. Black slab of glass, very nice, very shiny. If you touch it here, that bit gets hot. You know how hard it is to drive a touchscreen when you're trying to kind of do it with your wrong hand because you're busy, because you have a guitar in this hand, you're talking to someone over there and you just want to turn a track down? Tactile mixing desks where you have physical knobs and faders that you can find in the dark and just turn it down, turn it up. You don't need to look at what it's doing because your fingers will tell you which track is on and which track is off. I'm a huge fan of physical tactile interfaces for this kind of thing. And so I like the fact that this gave me a way of running it into a physical mixing desk. So how do you make a karaoke track with 5.1 audio? Well, that's kind of a solved problem. Adobe Premiere, which is one of the kind of market leading video editing packages, has a thing called the surround sound mixer. So you open a project in Premiere, and what I did is I just said, right, give me, I got five tracks here. So I'm gonna have lead guitar, bass guitar, rhythm guitar, and then all the other instruments in a stereo mix, back left and back right. And then you just pick up each track in the surround mixer here, and you're like, all right, so backing left, let's drag that and lock it onto that speaker. Backing right, we'll lock it onto that speaker. Lead guitar, front left, bass guitar, bang in the middle down the front, rhythm guitar, ooh, pop it, there we go. Rhythm guitar, right hand channel, and now we have five clean outputs coming out of that video file. All we need now is a player. Video player that is not going to fall over. Video player that is not gonna stop playing because it got a notification. A video player that has been used for decades in all manner of hostile IT environments. A player that really whips the llama's ass. Yep. Guitar Yoki runs on Winamp because Winamp does not fall down. You give it a 5.1 video and it goes, well, of course I'm gonna play this. What else would I do? Um, and it's done that since 1997. The first time I saw Winamp was one of those, what is that and why doesn't it look like Microsoft Office and can I have a copy of it, please? Um, I still use Winamp every week. I use it for all kinds of things. It is an astonishingly solid, powerful piece of software. So at this point, I kind of ticked all the boxes. I had a format, I had a way of getting hold of these backing tracks, I had a player, I had the hardware I needed to do it. It was all kind of held together with smoke mirrors and gaffer tape a little bit, but ship it. Let's go live. Now, this was around July last year, and uh, my birthday's in August. I just had my birthday last week. My birthday last year, I pinged my local brewery tap, and I was like, hey, can I run a birthday party at your place with live guitar karaoke? And they said, yeah, cool. So we did. Um, took all the equipment down, set everything up, put up a projector so people could see the lyrics and everything. Folks turned up, they had a good time, they played, they sang, people played bass, people played guitar, whole system worked. There was one overwhelming piece of feedback I had afterwards. They said to me, can we have the guitar music on the video? Because the singers, yeah, they're fine, they got the words, they just need to sing along with that. At this particular one, we're kind of relying on the musicians knowing the songs well enough to play along with it. And there are people who do that. You go and hang out in any guitar shop for more than a couple of hours on a Saturday, and some kid will walk in off the street. Now, remember, I'm 45, so to me, a kid is anyone born after Reagan became president. Some kid walks in off the street and they'll play Sweet Child of Mine all the way through and they'll play Led Zeppelin and all this kind of stuff. And they're not in a band or anything, but they know the songs, they know how to do it. Um, I maybe thought that was kind of the target audience for this. It turns out I was wrong, but more on that later. But the overwhelming feedback was, can we have chords on the videos? And I was like, I guess that's technically possible, but this is kind of a one-off. Like I did it just to scratch this itch of could you make guitar karaoke happen? Maybe do it again one day. A couple of days later, I get an email from the brewery saying, hey, that was great, do you want to do it every month? <laughs> now, uh, my calendar, I approach calendars the way most people approach Tetris. If there is a gap, you should probably slot something neatly into it. Unfortunately, one calendars, when you fill up a row, it doesn't disappear, it just sits there, building up your workload. And the other thing is that the physics of my Tetris calendar actually looks more like this. But I somehow managed to find that the third Saturday of every month for about eight months I would be able to do this and so I said yes. I sort of exhausted, yeah, of course, no, it's fine. I'm sure we'll figure out ways to make this work. 
which meant I had two months, from August to October last year, to figure out how do I solve the problem of putting guitar chords onto a karaoke video so people can jam along with it. Now, I had absolutely no idea how to do this. You know, the sky's, I'm like, okay, okay could this be a, it could be a web thing. Maybe I could do it with a web, maybe I could do web with animated JavaScript on a canvas in front of video. Maybe I need to do it in C. Because like there's the VLC player, that's written in C, right? Maybe I need to learn C. To, maybe I can do it in Maui. Maybe I can do an iOS application. Uh, maybe I could do it real time. Maybe it needs to be a processing pipeline. Literally, it's like, I think computer can do this. I just have no idea how. So what I did is I worked backwards. I went into um, After Effects, Adobe After Effects, and I created manually a couple of different prototypes of what I thought this thing needed to look like. And I came up with this. So this is just the regular karaoke video with the guitar chord shapes just moving across the bottom and when they hit that playhead bar there, that's where you hit the chord change. And I thought, okay, that's it, that seems to work. I did this setup for a couple of songs, thought, okay, that's probably gonna work. Next question, how the hell do we do that? So I started looking around, because I need to get these chords from somewhere. And uh, I discovered there was a research project. It's called VAMP. And VAMP is uh, Queen Mary's University in London with a whole bunch of collaborators all over Europe and around the world. It's a set of plugins for doing audio analysis. So the idea is that you throw an audio file at this thing and it will go, uh, okay, I found the tempo. I can tell you where the beats are. So if you want to go through like your whole MP3 collection and find the songs which are the right speed for you to listen to while you're jogging or you're on an exercise bike or whatever, in theory it can do that. And one of the plugins that exists for VAMP is a thing called Cordino which claims to do harmonic analysis of audio files, and it'll tell you what the chords are. So I download this, and I run it, and uh, that's when I realize I'm on an M1 Mac. Now, M1 Macs are a nice idea that'll be really good in about five years when they finish fixing all the things that are broken. Because most of the time, M1 Macs will run old software built for Intel because they run it through a layer called Rosetta, which translates all the instructions from old Intel instructions to new Apple Silicon instructions and back again. And it mostly works unless you are trying to do something like host audio analysis plugins, because then it just goes, no. And you're like, why not? It's like, well, this bit we're translating and that bit's running natively, and no, that, that it's not gonna work. And I thought, well, this is fine. This is all open source, right? I can just download the source code and I'll compile the entire tool chain so it runs on a 64-bit Apple Silicon process. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not how open source works. I managed to download the code and it's like, okay, I'll build that. All right, that, oh, that doesn't work. I need this bit. Okay, I need that bit. I need, oh, hang on, I need that bit. Are you familiar with the expression yak shaving? Where you're like, oh, I want to run a karaoke night with guitars, which means I need chord shapes, which means I need to extract the harmonies, which means I need to run this plugin, which means I need to compile this thing, which means I need to compile a library it uses. And then someone looks over your shoulder and says, hey, why are you recompiling cmath.h? And you're like, I'm trying to run karaoke, can't you see? Yeah. So I backtrack a couple of steps. I'm like, maybe I don't, of course. Turns out it all runs on Windows as well. Absolutely fine. So I grab uh, the VAMP uh, library, I grab the Cordino plugin, and I grab this thing. It's an app called Sonic Visualizer, which gives you a kind of visual interface to explore these things. Now, we're going to do a little bit of a, a live demonstration now of just how good and how bad this technology is. Uh, what I got is I got a couple of tracks, and uh, I've renamed them, so there's no clues in the file names. So I'm going to open this up. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get it to extract what it thinks the chords are and see if any of you out there can recognize the song just from the chord extraction that has happened here. So I'm going to bring that up. So it's going to drop the chords in on the bottom half of the screen here. I'm going to turn off the original track and I'm going to play it. There's a recognizable progression coming up in a second. Let's bring the original track back in so you can see what it is. What a look, ABBA. Now this one, it got pretty good. Pretty close. Let's take a look at another one. So same thing, what I'm gonna do, open it up, I'm gonna mute the original and we're just gonna get the automatically extracted chord progression from it.
and Have any of you seen a project called Axis of Awesome? Well, I, I'm afraid I have news for Axis of Awesome. This is Don't Stop Believin' by Journey. It has five chords. It is not a four chord song. There are five chords in the intro to Don't Stop Believing. Let's kick the original back in. Any second now. And you see that one in there? That chord shouldn't be there. Most of it, it's picking this up pretty accurately, but there's a couple of chords that just do not fit. They shouldn't be there. Right, now the last one, I'm going to leave the original music in because I just want you to see how badly wrong it gets this. Because this was really promising. I was looking at this, it's amazing. I can automate the entire pipeline end to end. Now you'll recognize the music to this one, I hope, pretty much immediately. It's very famous, very distinctive. And it also demonstrates how this automated analysis doesn't work very well when all you've got is one very distorted guitar. It is. But now let's see what we get from the automated analysis. It's like, oh, an E major chord. All right, I can work with this. So, so that was kind of promising, but it wasn't going to solve the problem. It's like, yeah, we'll try it, and if it works, that's good, and if it doesn't work, I need a better way. What it did give me is it established the fact that there is this, uh, there's a command line version of Cordino as well, and what that does is it just spits out a text file which has the chord name and the exact timestamp where that chord change happens in the music. And so this kind of gave me an interface between the two halves of this problem. What it meant is, okay, I still, I know I have this. I have this point in the middle where I got this file which has the time and it has the chord name. I don't know how I'm gonna get there, and I don't know what I'm gonna do with it once I've got it, but that's a good way of dividing one big problem into two small problems, and then maybe I'll have a chance of being able to solve one of them, and then problem number two will output the video. <coughs> so problem number one, Cordino works on some tracks. For the rest, what I did is I hacked something together. Uh, this is Recorder. Now, this is, if you're familiar with Fred Brooks' maxim of when you design software, you should build one version to throw away, this is definitely the one I should throw away. But I haven't thrown it away yet. 50% of it is good, solid working code. The other 50% is things I've learned not to click on, because if it, I do, it'll crash. But it doesn't matter because the software is not the product. The product is a bunch of people in a bar playing guitar and having a good time. And all of these things, they are tools that exist to deliver the next iteration of that product. If I'd spent a lot of time kind of bulletproofing this and building features and stuff, and what probably would have happened is I'd never have finished it and none of this would ever actually have taken place. But what this does, it's a .NET web application running in the background so it can talk to the file system. It's got some JavaScript on the front end and it's exploiting the fact that web browsers can do all kinds of cool stuff, like they can play 5.1 surround video and mix it to stereo without you needing to do anything special. Did you know browsers could do that? I didn't. I just put the video in and it worked. So what this lets me do is basically down the left-hand side is a list of the songs that I haven't got chords for yet, pulled off the file system. I can go in. I can click on one of those. 
and then I can go on Google and I can find the guitar chords from one of the many, many websites that exist out there which will allow anybody to go, oh, I think I worked this song out. There is no quality control here. It is completely caveat emptor. So let's have a look at the first one of uh, Kenny Rogers here. Now this is, it's kind of right, but it's missing some bits. It's a little bit simplified, but that's all right. There's another version on here. So I can jump back. I can find one that looks like they probably got the intro and the bridges and the harmonies and the breaks and all those kinds of things. And then I built a parser. Well, no, what I built is something that can look at ASCII text and extract the things that it thinks are guitar chords. Calling it a parser is probably disrespectful to people who actually write parsers. But what I can do is I can copy the text, I can come over here, I can paste it in there. Now, when I said uh, there are things you click on, one of the ways that this application works is that every time you press a key, it pushes everything back to the server so you don't need a save button. If you paste and then forget to press a key, it accidentally loses track of your work, and so when you refresh, oh, there it is. So I'm gonna paste that back in. But then what it does when that uh, text area in the middle, when that blurs, is it goes through and it runs this chord recognition filter across it, and it highlights all the chords, and then there is a button here called button, because I didn't know what else to call it, but when you hit button, it starts playing the video, and then every time you hit the space bar, it just puts the next chord out of the transcript and it drops it into the chord timing chart. And so this way, you can grab the ASCII files off the internet, you can drop them in here, and just go through and relatively quickly... Now, I did have a prototype of this where I used the MIDI interface, so I had to play the chords on a piano. I realized I'm not that good a piano player, like, not even close. Like, hitting the space bar, I can kind of do that. Having it actually, like, the black notes and the white notes, that was beyond what I could do. Um, do you want to see the regular expression that we use? Because chords, in English, we have the, the, the major scale chords, A, B, C, D. Now, the only false positive I got on this was A, because capital letter A occurs in written English, so it crops up in song lyrics. It also crops up in the chords. Then there are the accidentals. Now, this is fine because uh, there is nobody in the world sad enough that they would actually write a song about C sharp or F sharp, even though those are programming things. So that's not something we need to worry about. There are the flats as well. We can pull those out. None of those occurs in written English. But chords get more complicated than you think. So what I got here, I've got the jazzometer in the bottom corner here. So we got a B, which is a nice, simple ACDC kind of chord. Then we got B flat, I'm getting a little bit bluesy. B flat minor, B flat minor seven, B flat minor seven, add nine, with an F in the bass. Now we are firmly into modern jazz territory. Now, there aren't a lot of these in the kind of things people play at karaoke nights. When they do crop up, it's normally because Cordino has made a mistake. But I wanted to be able to pick these out. Now, a lot of the time, you have a B-flat minor 7 add 9 with an F in the bass. What you've got to do is get Mark to play the F, get everyone else to play B-flat minor, and don't worry about the 7 add 9 because you're probably not going to notice in a bar full of drunk people. This is the regular expression that will recognize chords in pieces of ASCII. Because we love regular expressions, right? I asked ChatGPT to explain this to me, and it went, I, uh, no, I don't know what you did there. So uh, it's all right, our jobs are safe, humans who can read regular expressions. So there we go, back to our, our project Gantt chart here. Problem number one is now solved. I have the timing charts, I can make them automatically, or I can make them by whacking the space bar over and over again with some ASCII that I found on the internet, and a regular expression, because hey, engineering, right? Problem number two, how do we make the video? Now. Uh, you do anything with computers and video, sooner or later, you will find FFmpeg. Because FFmpeg is amazing for two reasons. One, it is the most powerful, capable piece of software. There is no video or audio format known to humankind that FFmpeg cannot read and write and encode and compress and decompress. It is also the most hostile piece of software. Like, after a couple of weeks with FFmpeg, people go, I miss Lotus Notes. I liked Lotus Notes. Lotus Notes loved me. Lotus Notes was my friend. At its most basic, you say, hey, FFmpeg, minus I, input MP3, turn it into output.wav. And it goes, yeah, I can do that. It can do just about anything if you can find the right syntax for it. You want to take an input file, you want to apply an audio resampling, map it to 44,100 hertz, two audio channels, 320 bits per second, output format MP3, it'll do that. You want to take a 5.1, video file, like the guitar files we got here, 
and you want to say, take 5.1, extract it, put this much guitar in that channel, this much in that channel, this much in that channel, back left, back right, move them to the front, rescale it to 640 by 360 pixels, start at 45 seconds, extract a 30 second clip, libx264, encode it, 2500 kilobits per second of video, 128K of audio, use the AAC filter, and output the result as a flash video. Yeah, one line, easy. Now, I absolutely believe that you should be able to go FFmpeg, minus I living on a prayer, minus guitar karaoke, minus lead guitar, rhythm guitar, bass, band left, band right, chord color this, playhead true output. I believe it exists. I just don't think we'll ever find the combination of keystrokes that makes it happen. Like, it wouldn't surprise me at all if somebody went, oh yeah, FFmpeg can do that, because it probably can. Well, maybe, I don't know. Um, but FFmpeg does have a lot of really powerful video mixing, overlaying, composition, multiplexing capabilities. So that was gonna come into the tool chain somewhere, but I needed to do a bit of processing first. Now, I like C-sharp. I like writing C-sharp, and when you are doing software development for fun to run karaoke nights with your friends, why would you do it in a language you hate or a system that makes you uncomfortable? I was like, I'm going to do this in C Sharp as much as I can. Now, all the code for this is on GitHub if you really want to dive deep into how it all works and how it hangs together. I just want to show you the kind of high level approach here. So, what I did is I created a chord class and I broke a chord down into the name and the extra bit. Now, this is not a musical uh, thing, this is a typesetting thing. Because when engravers set sheet music, the chord name is nice and big, and then everything else, flat, minor, major, seven, diminished, that's normally set a little smaller. It's a convention that I wanted to obey because there's only so much space on the screen. And so when it goes through this file, it parses each chord, pulls out the name, extracts the extra bit just by doing string split, and the time, when does that chord get played? So that represents, now there is a read chords method in there. It's gonna pull in the chord times file path, select each line, map that onto a chord. Um, the parsing error, by the way, any chord it can't recognize, it gives you a time of minus one, so we can just filter those out. Any chord that starts before zero, scrub it. Not part of the song. Then I go through every one of these and I calculate the distance, or the time, the time interval between the previous chord and this one, it gives me the duration. If there are lots of very, very short chords, it means I need to draw them on two lines so you can get them all on screen at the same time. If the chord changes are relatively far apart, you can draw the whole thing on one line. And then this runs through the whole thing and does that. It looks for chords whose duration is below a threshold and it says, right, I'm gonna move you onto line two. I'm gonna move you onto line two. Everything else stays on line one. Bring back a collection of chords from that. Now, this then gets fed into, so we pull out read chords calculate the duration of the track, use that to calculate how many frames of video we need to render, and then create a thing called a frame maker. Now, frame maker is something that I built for this. You say, hey, how wide's the video? How high is the video? How many frames per second? And then you call FM create frames. We'll have a look at that in a second. Now, there is a thing called a raw video pipe source, which is a memory mapped interface from .NET into FFmpeg. So you can spin up .NET, you can put a bunch of video frames, frame by frame by frame, in a massive continuous block of memory, and then tell FFmpeg to treat that as if it was an input stream and apply all of its encoding stuff to it. So this is the bit which renders all of those, and what it does is it creates a transparent video. So you got your original song, four minutes of video with lyrics on it. Now we have four minutes of transparent video using a, it's a format called WebM, and uh, it uses a thing called the VPX9 codec, which allows you to have alpha channels in video information. So now we have two videos. We got the original, and we got a transparent one full of animated guitar chords. Now that frame maker bit there, I'm not gonna show you the code for that because it's gnarly and it's mostly mathematics, but the only reason that exists is because of this amazing open source library. It's a thing called Image Sharp. And uh, Jim Bob Squarepants, if you are listening, if Guitar Yoki ever makes any money, I promise I will give you some because this is a wonderful library and none of the stuff with the chord rendering and stuff would have been possible without it. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they've had some uh, uh, .NET drama about their licensing policies over the last couple of years. But seriously, this is an awesome piece of kit. And basically what I've been doing with it is going through and saying, right, okay, so we're drawing a frame. First of all, are there any chords on this frame? Look at the timing, figure out when does the current video frame start and end in the song. If there are, then I want you to go through every chord that belongs on this frame, calculate physically where to put it by taking the playhead position, the chord time, the playback speed, the frames per second, and then there's a thing here called chord nudge in pixels. Now, the human brain is weird. If we see things before we hear them, 
our brain will make them line up because the speed of light versus speed of sound means that in the natural world, you often see something before you hear it. If you hear something before you see it, your brain goes, no, 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 this is bad and wrong and we hate it. But you don't have to get it exactly right. You just need to make sure that you are erring on the side of coming up on screen first. So everything gets nudged off by about 48 pixels, which then gives the illusion that it lands at exactly the right moment, even when it doesn't quite. Um, spin up a point, work out. Now, image.mutate is uh, image shop's mechanism of saying, hey, I want to take that, and I want to draw this stuff on it, and I want to draw this stuff on it. So we're drawing the chord's pretty name which is the nice name or just the short name. And then if the chord doesn't have an extra bit, hey, continue. Otherwise, do all the rectangle metrics calculations to figure out how big you draw the flat 7 minus 9 diminished with an F in the base. Stick all that on there. And then finally, draw the bar over the top and draw the little white playhead. Now, one of the optimizations in here is that if the frame is empty, it just returns clones of the same empty frame over and over again. So we only ever draw the empty frame once. In any other scenario, we clone that and use that as the canvas we're drawing everything else on top of. So that gives us this frames. It returns an I enumerable. We wrap those up in a memory stream and pipe all that into this FFmpeg processor. And then once that's done, there's just a little bit here. Now, at this point, I'm just using .NET to drive the command line. And I'm saying, I want you to grab that video. I want you to draw it on top of that video. I want you to apply these filtering settings to it. I want you to, uh, there's various options to render like a 30-second preview and stuff, which you can see in the code if you want to look at that. And then finally, show done banner. Now, because this takes four or five minutes, I would often start it running and then go and do something on the other side of the room. And so the last thing this does is it draws a massive bright pink ASCII art done on the screen. So I can glance over and go, oh, another one's done. And I can go over and I can kick off the next one. So that seems like, A, it's the end of the rendering pipeline process. Now, we are going to be running live guitar karaoke right here on this stage later tonight. So this is kind of only the first half of the talk. There will be a live demo, but it's going to be later when everyone's had a couple of beers and feels like getting up and singing and playing some stuff. If you want to see all the code that drove this video, it is on uh, GitHub. There is an organization called Guitarioki. The tools are in there. Go, look it up, poke it around. The music is not. You are going to have to buy your own backing tracks if you want to play with this, because I do not want to get sued for putting Bon Jovi on GitHub, because that is a terrible reason to go to prison. We are going to be back on this stage later on tonight. I'm doing a show here with Line Breakers, and then Guitar Karaoke will be kicking off. If any of you out there have seen this, and I want to have a go at that, come and talk to me now. And what we'll do is we'll line up a set so we can get things up and running, figure out who wants to play what, and then we're going to throw it open to the rest of the festival later. But folks, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions about a talk that went from the history of karaoke machines to rendering algorithm pipelines in .NET and FFmpeg? Or have we achieved the silence of enlightenment? I did. So the first version, the first one that ran in August had no chords. The second one, there were chords on every song, except one. Bohemian Rhapsody was taken off the list because it's too bloody difficult. It'll be back one day. That's stretch goals. Um, Huh? Why would I do Soundgarden? Yeah. Does anyone know a C flat six? We don't need that. Like they did that. They, they did that, and they did it for the rest of us, so we don't have to. <laughs> yes. Strumming patterns. So, the thing about karaoke is that. I believe it assumes a certain level of familiarity with the material. It's the difference between singing karaoke and like if you sing in a choir. Um, you know, I, I know classically trained professional singers who you give them a piece of music that they've never heard and you give them the sheet music and they sing it and they can do that. Um, karaoke is not like that and so I sort of assumed that if you know the song and you can see the chords, you can figure the rest out for yourself. And if you don't get it quite right, um, I have had a couple of people go, can we have the, the guitar tabs on there? And so I've shown them what guitar tabs look like in real time and been, can you read this? And they're like, well, no. I'm like, exactly, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's enough that you can kind of figure it out and get it right. But no, it doesn't have strumming patterns. If it needs strumming, do you think it needs strumming patterns? I don't know. Well, what's the audience consensus on this? So <laughs> Any other questions, folks? Yes? Sorry, you're going to need to yell. I'm deaf. It looks like Positive Grid Spark, a product for free you can download. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's a YouTube video there. Uh... All right. 
We're just going to see live on stage if I've wasted the last year of my life. <laughs> da, 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 da. Are there any questions that aren't, you shouldn't have done all that, you can get it for free on the internet. Da, 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 da. What is it? Positive grid spark. Uh, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let, let's see. So what, what is positive grid spark? Uh, yep. That one, that, that's a YouTube video. <laughs> okay, I will take a look at that later. Um, but I, I will also bet you a beer that it does not do get the chords up, get the vocals up, mix out the bass guitar, bring in the rhythm guitar, and let someone play the solo for the final countdown. There's a lot of people doing similar things in this kind of space with various tuition tools. Um, if you've seen Rocksmith, uh, the computer game, um, Rocksmith is basically this, but like for a very, very sort of advanced user interface and things. Um, but no, that looks interesting. I'll check it out. Any other questions? Yes? What is the entire pipeline time from, hey, that'll be a cool song, to here's a video? Um, about 15 minutes, um, of which a good chunk is waiting for karaoke version to give you the download link because it generates the mixes on request. So you click the button, it takes about 20, 30 seconds for it to generate each file, download the files. I have an automation script that turns them into a Premiere project, so everything's already mixed in the right place. You render that with the Adobe pipeline, that takes about 90 seconds. Uh, then if Cordino picks it up, it just picks it up, you're done. If you need to make the chords manually, that, uh, if you're familiar with the song, you can, I've got it right on one pass through at real time before. So if it's a four minute song, it takes you four minutes to do it. Often I'll screw up the first time and need to go back and tweak a couple of things. Um, and then the, uh, the video rendering pipeline takes, uh, on the M1 Mac, it takes about 150% of the duration of the song. So a four minute song, it'll be a six minute encoding job to spit out the completed video at the end of it. But uh, when, when we do this, um, so Mark Rendell comes along and we do this in London uh, fairly regularly. And uh, we had a thing of trying to add five new songs every time we do it to keep expanding the repertoire. And it got to a point where putting those five songs in would be about a two hour job. So, so I knew I needed two hours on Friday to bash the songs in, get the chords, do the rendering, drop them in, and then they'd be ready to go for us to run through on Saturday. So uh, yeah, it's not quite real time, but it's, uh, I can't imagine doing it on a 486, that's for sure. <laughs> Any other questions, folks? All right. Thank you for coming. We'll see you later this evening. <laughs>